Is Germany on the path to becoming a major military power? Since the beginning of the war in Ukraine, the country has been undergoing a period of intense soul-searching as it re-evaluates its responsibilities in the area of defence. In a groundbreaking address to the Bundestag following Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Chancellor Olaf Scholz declared a watershed moment, marking a fundamental shift in how Germany sees its role in the world. To talk more about this, I'm joined now by Katharina Engberg, a defence analyst who previously served as Sweden's defence representative to NATO and the EU in Brussels. Katharina, you published a very interesting paper looking at how Germany is reevaluating its security role in the world. You talked with a range of government officials. What was the general message? Well, I'm surprised by the quick change of uh, worldview uh, of Germany. Uh, I know there's been a fierce debate in Germany regarding uh, the need to move swifter and to uh, uh, and many complaints about uh, Germany not uh, taking the necessary steps in order to uh, respond to the new realities. But for me, having followed German defense and security policy over decades, I'm surprised at the uh, at the uh, new realization, the swiftness of change of mind that I find in Berlin. And uh, uh, this makes it very important for all of us, uh, not only Germans, but for Swedes and other Europeans to follow very closely how German defense policies will evolve over time, because it will be decisive for European security. Yeah, you say you were surprised. Um, what about the response of other European countries to, to this shift in German policy? Well, there has been this continuous complaints about Germany not shaping up and not responding uh, rapidly enough. Uh, but I think uh, the political change was there fairly soon, and that was important. Then to uh, put money and resources to the task, that's a different sort of task. And that will take time, not only for Germany, but also for my own country. Our defense sectors have been underinvested uh, since the end of the Cold War and will take long time to catch up and uh, to uh, build the capabilities that correspond to today's challenging, challenging security environment. And I think it might be particularly difficult for Germany uh, for a number of reasons, but one reason being that it's just shouldering a greater responsibility now for Europe's security, as was pointed out in its national security strategy where it uh, where it's very clearly states the, that the aim is to become a cornerstone of European conventional defense. So trying to fulfilling that task in terms of resource uh, allocation uh, will take years, if not a decade for Germany. Let's talk more about money then, because Germany is going to spend nearly 72 billion euros on defence this year. That is more than it ever has done before. It's also using a special 100 billion euro fund to meet the NATO target of spending 2% of GDP on defence. Where is this money going specifically? Uh, well, uh, there's a lot of capabilities that have to, have to be built up. Um, ranging from ammunition to air defense, and Germany have, has made a lot of investments lately, uh, just starting with the, uh, in terms of air capability, the purchase of uh, the American F-35 aircraft, uh, fighter aircraft, but it's also a question of personnel, and this is something that takes a long time for any country to build up uh, the personnel it needed for such a, uh, an ambition to put 300,000 troops at the disposal of NATO's new forces, as Germany has done. You cannot command, well, you can, if you uh, change your policy to a conscript system, then you can command people to actually serve in the armed forces. But short of that, you have to compete in a labor market that is already tight in terms of uh, access to young people who would want to do, do to become officers or just served in the armed forces. So uh, I think um, uh, even though it, it's very costly to buy all these new systems that are needed for in terms of various defense capabilities, I would point to uh, the personnel shortages as uh, one of the most serious challenges to uh, German defense ambitions. But I would also underline that 
this is not unique for Germany. We are experiencing something of the same in Sweden, although we have reintroduced a more limited form of conscript system. Uh, but still, we have left the uh, entire focus on professional armed forces that we opted for after the end of the Cold War. But getting the personnel to serve, that's uh, a very difficult task. Is it conceivable to you that Germany could reintroduce conscription? Yes, and I think you are studying it. And uh, from my hear from my my uh, friends' offices in both in Berlin and here in Sweden, there are conversations going between German and Swedish defense officials, where the German defense officials are inquiring us about our experience of reintroducing. I would say reintroduce it in a very limited uh, amount of numbers, but still the principle of conscript. It's only about 8,000 that are being called up currently. And one of the limitations is where we just don't have officers to educate all these young people that we would want to recruit through an, an expanded conscript system. So I think Germans, Germany is looking at the Swedish experience of reintroducing the conscript system. I do not know what the conclusion will be, but I think this is a an alternative that is being looked at, at least. How do you think that would go down among the German public? Well, you <laughs> Germans would be the judge of that. Um, difficult, of course. Uh, difficult. However, in my country, there is, I think, a very clear realization of the fact that the security situation has changed profoundly in Europe. And there we are faced with existential issues. So there's a seriousness um, to be uh, reckoned with. And that translates, of course, more into more of a willingness to serve. But you know, then there's always the competition for young people who may have better office, offers in uh, of doing different things, uh, more interesting things, better paid things. And that's another limitation for armed forces, that you cannot compete with the private sector in terms of the salaries you offer to uh, to young people who sign up for, uh, not only for uh, being a conscript for a limited time, but for, to serve uh, more long term in the armed forces. So I guess that would apply to Germany as well. I don't know to what extent the pacifist mood that has marked so much of German consciousness since the end of the Second World War is still there with young people. I would guess there is some, so that there would be some reluctance that uh, is related uh, to your historical experiences as that we do not share, of course. Absolutely. And it also is weighing heavily on Germany's relationship with France, because the two countries don't exactly see eye to eye on a range of issues, including plans for a joint air defence system. What is the source of that disagreement? Well, the source of that disagreement is that quite a substantial part of the new 100 billion euro fund that you mentioned has been dispersed on the purchase of these American 535 planes, which are very expensive. Now, many other countries in Europe are doing the same. They are buying the American planes uh, because they feel that's a way of um, securing, of getting a sort of an indirect security, reinforced security guarantees from the Americans. If they buy Americans, they can count more on American support. I think that applies in particular for these Europeans. But I think there's an element of that too uh, in the German uh, decision. And, and of course, there's a judgment regarding the capability of these planes that have been important for, as well. Uh, but nevertheless, that has uh, gobbled up quite a substantial uh, chunk. And uh, you have both Israeli uh, air defense uh, systems component uh, and uh, shun French initiatives, European initiatives. Uh, and I think the argument, uh, which of course has uh, not been well received in Paris, I think the German argument has been that uh, these systems are there now. And it would take time to develop, for example, a French or European alternatives, which are under the way in, in, with regard to some capabilities, but still under the development. And, and, and given the uh, deteriorating security situation, Germany has given priority to the swift purchase off the shelf, as you say, from capabilities that they're already there. And Israelis, as we know, have a lot of experience of, in terms of air defense.
I'm also wondering about how sustainable this spending is going to be. That 100 billion euro fund is due to run out in 2027, and that is what is enabling Germany to meet its 2% of GDP target for NATO. How do you see this turning out? Well, that's true. I think the baseline uh, defense spending for Germany is now 1.5, and you reach the 2% by through the addition uh, over the years uh, until 27 through the spe special fund. Yeah, what will be the decision of the next generation of, uh, uh, of politicians or the next uh, uh, governments of Germany? Uh, I do not know. From reading the press, uh, one is told that discussion, there are serious discussions going on in the in the government, in with the German Bundestag regarding long-term funding, and that there is a consensus among uh, the major parties regarding the necessity to secure the long-term funding. However, I do think that um, um, Germany may, in the end, have to look at this debt break uh, that is confining its uh, its uh, expenditure, as you <laughs> suffered. A crisis uh, from uh, from the activation of the debt break in the in the fall. Uh, I just don't think that um, there will be enough resources in the government uh, to cover what may not be only two percent, but even more, three or even four percent, uh, in terms of future defense spending without sort of uh, changing something in the in terms of governance over German financial resources. And I say this because I think not only is it, as many NATO countries made lots of pledges at the Vilnius summit last summer, but now when they are going to transform these pledges into realities, capabilities, investment, they find they are more expensive than they thought. So this in, in itself puts a strain, financial strain, on not only on Germany, but also other nations. Uh, take Lithuania, we are going to put a brigade. Now they have to cover most of the costs for building the infrastructure for the German brigade. Uh, themselves, they get some from NATO, but it's also a question of national uh, spending. And, and I think that's a realization now shaking in uh, in many capitals that this is more expensive than, than uh, one thought of. But I would like to add an element, and that is uh, that... Uh, we may face, we may, as European, over the next decades, I'm afraid, live in an insecure situation uh, with regard to uh, Russia, Russia's policies. Uh, I wouldn't expect the war in Ukraine to end in a clear-cut peace agreement, but rather a frozen conflict. Uh, in the, and in parallel, we would, as a European, have to take on a greater responsibility for Ukraine, primarily through the European Union, integrating functionally in various manners Ukraine into uh, into the European Union, even though it will take a long time. But that means that we, as Europeans, will have to shoulder a great responsibility for the security of Ukraine, but also to live with uh, a border with Russia that stretches from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, uh, which in part is composed of a frozen conflict. Uh, and even if we don't have a Trump in, uh, as a president in Washington uh, in November, I think it's time for the Europeans to shoulder more of the responsibility for its own security. But we are going, if we are going to do that, that, it will take more than the 2% that the countries now have committed to. Let's look at the contribution of the private sector then. I want to show some pictures of a groundbreaking ceremony that recently took place at weapons maker Rheinmetall in Lower Saxony. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz was there, as was Defence Minister Boris Pistorius. Rheinmetall has been a big supplier of weapons to Ukraine. Its share price has tripled since Russia's invasion. European defence stocks in general are up too. As uncomfortable as it is to talk about economics in this context, to what extent do you think the defence industry could provide a boost to Germany's languishing economy? Well, um, Russia certainly is living through a Keynesian uh, war stimulus of its economy. <laughs> I'm not sure it will be sustainable in the long run, but it's obvious that if you make major public investments and I'm not talking about Russia now, but uh, about European countries, that may boost uh, growth. Um, however, uh, many of these new investment in necessary capabilities will probably require an element of public, uh, uh, of, of public 
uh, resources securing this investment uh, because uh, the defense industry has not been used to producing for wartime conditions since the end of the Cold War. It has been uh, built down, it has, has been closed, some of the industries have closed, and now as we uh, re-energize this sector of our societies, and Sweden is also a, um, a country uh, with a considerable defense industry, it takes time to bake up, big up the infrastructure for to meet the demands, political demands, in terms, for example, the one million artillery shells that we have promised uh, Ukraine uh, to deliver. And uh, the, uh, the European Union in particular has uh, realized that uh, it has to provide a long-term security to, uh, to the industry, that uh, this is not just a one-off thing and then the Ukraine war ends and we will uh, no more, uh, we will make, uh, the procurements will, uh, will end. Uh, and industry will be asking, uh, how do we know that this is not a one-off thing only, that uh, we can actually invest in long-term capability? I mean, this is not, not investment over a year or two years, but over decades. So the European Union has come up with different uh, proposals, and, uh, and not only proposals, but also funds that sort of make an, uh, an, uh, an investment early on in the procurement and in the build-up of, uh, of uh, this in the build-up of the capabilities of the industries that produce ammunition, for example, there is a special fund for from the European from the European. The European Union cannot, from its budget, fund the payment of the ammunition. That's why we have an off-budget fund called the peace facility that has been uh, paying for the military resources that European countries have been given to the Ukraine. But in terms of ramping up production capability, you can use actually the, the, the budget of the European Union. So some money has been allocated from that in order to give uh, relevant industry the security to start to build up the capability to make uh, a, to produce not only one million uh, artillery shells uh, this year, but over time. Because as we have been discussing previously, it's not only Ukraine that need artillery shells. We need them for our own defense forces that have been uh, underinvested and uh, and now to some extent depleted uh, by the resources we have uh, given to the Ukraine. Sweden has, for example, given some 20 billion in value, 20 billion Swedish crowns to uh, in terms of defense material to Ukraine, which corresponds to uh, substantial, particularly army resources that we now have to rebuild ourselves. So there is this uh, need to build up defense industrial capability, uh, not only for Ukraine, but for ourselves. But this is a long term commitment and uh, industry will need public spending commitments of security of various sorts in order to uh, to start production lines that will line will last for long the, longer than a year or two. Mm -hmm. And as you say, this all takes an awfully long time. German defence spending is up, but the country is still incredibly far behind globally. If you just look at the biggest weapons makers, they are all from the US. Germany's largest player, Rheinmetall, is way down the list. We are in an election year in the US. The likely Republican candidate, Donald Trump, you already mentioned him earlier, said flippantly or not, who knows, that he would encourage Russia to, quote, do whatever the hell they want to any NATO member that doesn't reach defence spending targets. How much of a security threat does a second Trump presidency pose for Germany? Well, I, I, it is a challenge to all of us Europeans, and I would guess in particular for Germany, who has built some of um, its post-Second World War security policy on the, on the assumption that the, the US is not only the protector uh, of Germany and Europeans, but also sort of the guarantor, guarantor that Germany will pursue uh, a, 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 a post-war policy, defense policy. That sort of double security connection with the US is very important for, for Germany. Um, so I think this is maybe more dramatic for Germany than for many other countries because Germany being the largest uh, country in terms of defense spending and the fourth of uh, EU GMP and so on, <laughs> will now step, have, to, have to step forward without the protection and the coaching, not only the protection, but the coaching uh, provided for by the American. 
by the Americans. And I think we should make this as, as a matter only of Trump or Biden. I think we shall look at the long-term trends by which, uh, as we know, both uh, administrations would prioritize Asia. Now, Americans wanted to get out of the Middle East and out of Europe, and now they are back in both. So they cannot pivot only to Asia. But still, China is the ultimate challenge for the Americans, which means that we have to step up as Europeans to fill not an immediate void, not in terms, not a weakening of a dramatic weakening of security guarantees by the Biden administration, in particular if, if Biden is re-elected. But still, there's this is uh, a long-term trend that uh, we cannot expect the Americans to carry this burden uh, to the same extent that they have done. If Trump comes into power, then of course. Uh, uh, we do not know what a second Trump administration would mean in terms of defense policy. In spite of all the rhetoric of the first Trump administration, reinforcements, military reinforcements were made in Europe, uh, the hands for the presence in the Baltic states, etc. So uh, one has to distinguish between rhetoric and, and uh, real policies, if I say so. But still, there is um, a very strong isolationist trend in the Republican Party, and which is reflected uh, in Trump, but is wider than the issue of Trump. Uh, and um, one argument that is being made in the American debate is not only that the Mexican border is a more important issue, but rather that we need the money for ourselves. Uh, we need to make investment in our own country. So this sort of isolationist policy could be more radical for a second Trump administration than in the first, which would mean uh, that we could actually see a weakening of uh, American commitment to European security. Um, still uncertain, but as Europeans, we should uh, plan for this uh, uh, likely for this sort of development. Only not only because we expect it to come true, but also because it's uh, sound for the Europeans to uh, assume responsibility for, for more responsibility for its security, while trying, of course, to preserve the transatlantic relationship. But I do think in the long run, it will be the Europeans that will have a responsibility to shoulder responsibility, not only for Ukraine and Ukrainian economy and reconstruction, but also for peace and the, for, for the protection of Ukraine. Given all this uncertainty and the fragility of the transatlantic relationship, there is a debate taking place in Germany right now about the need to develop a nuclear deterrent in the EU. Did you ever think you would see this debate taking place? Uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, well, I'm surprised that German politicians saw uh, a few. I guess it's only one, I think, at, uh, for the time being, spelling out this so, so clearly because of the signal, the importance of the signal it's giving. But I think that uh, it is important uh, in terms of future security to remind ourselves that uh, we have two nuclear capable European countries, which is the UK uh, and France. The difference between the UK and France is that France produces its, its own nuclear capabilities from fissile material to to the rockets and the platforms, uh, while the British rely on American fissile material. So I think this is uh, something that we have to discuss more, and the French have uh, on and off sort of hinted at the possibility of sharing discussions on nuclear doctrine with European partners and so on. Um, and I think this issue will now re-emerge. How do we assess the importance of European nuclear capability in view of a potential weakening of an American security commitment. I think this doesn't need, again, to be an either or, but I think it's just a maturing sort of, sort of a maturing of European responsibility. And then we cannot uh, circumvent, uh, in particular, I'd say the French nuclear capability. And, and I would then expect that the, the French, the French offers to share doctrine and, and, and some other elements of the nuclear policies with partners that would, could have a more positive response in Berlin. Now, Germany itself producing nuclear weapons is, of course, a different matter altogether. Do you see that happening? I find it difficult at this point.
Katharina Engberg, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you.